The world of pins was simple, and Stanley knew his way around it as a goldfish knows its tank, but everything else was very complicated and only worked if you followed the rules. He glanced up at the grubby little windows. They were far too small to climb through and had been welded shut by many applications of official paint, so he broke one pane as neatly as possible to allow some fresh air in. He made a note of this in the breakages book. Mr Grote was still breathing, although with an unpleasant bubbling sound. There was a first aid kit in the locker room, because regulations demanded it, but it contained only a small length of bandage, a bottle of something black and sticky, and Mr Grote's spare teeth. Mr Grote had told him never to touch his homemade medicines, and since it was not unusual for bottles to explode during the night, Stanley had always observed this rule very carefully. He did not say in the regulations, if attacked by a huge, swooping, screaming creature, hit hard in the mouth with sack of pins, and Stanley wondered if he should pencil this in, but that would be defacing post office property, and he could get into trouble for that. All avenues of further activity being therefore closed, Stanley remained calm. It was a gentle snow of letters. Some landed still burning, fountaining out of the column of crackling fire that had already broken through the post office roof. Some were blackened ashes on which sparks travelled in mockery of the dying ink. Some, many, had sailed up and over the city unscathed, zigzagging down gently like communications from an excessively formal sort of god. Moist tore off his jacket as he pushed through the crowd. The people probably got out, said Miss Dearheart, clattering along beside him. Do you really think so, said Moist? Really? No. Not of guilt, set this up. Sorry, I'm not very good at being comforting anymore. Moist paused and tried to think. The flames were coming out of the roof at one end of the building. The main door on the whole left side looked untouched, but fire was sneaky stuff, he knew. It sat there and smouldered into the open door to see how it was getting on, and then the fire caught its breath and the eyeballs got solid to the sky. I'd better go in, he said. Um, can say that no there's no been far too brave for you, he added. Some people who were organising a bucket change in the nearby fountain. It would be as effective as speaking in the sun. Miss Dearheart caught a burning letter, lit a cigarette with it, and took a drag. No, no, don't do it, you've been far too brave. How is that for you? But if you do, the left side looks pretty clear. Watch out, though. There are rumours that guilt employs a vampire. What the world runs? Ah, fire kills, doesn't it? It kills everybody, Mr. Lippy, said Miss Dearheart. It kills everybody. She grabbed him by the ears and gave him a big kiss on the mouth. It was like being kissed by an ashtray, but in the room. I might think it's out of there, she said quietly. Are you sure you won't wait? The boys will be here in a minute. The girls, if they may off, they have to obey their chem, though. The fire and students are in danger. They'll smell it and be here in a minute, believe me. Moist hesitated, looking at her face. And people were watching him. He could not get in there. It wouldn't fit in with the persona. Gods, that's veterinary. He shook his head, turned and ran towards the doors. Best not to think about it. Best not to think about being so dumb. Just feel the front door quite. Open it gently, a rush of air but no explosion. The big door was lit with flame, but it was all above him. And if he weaved and dodged, he could make it to the door that led down to the locker room. He kicked it open. Stanley looked up from his steps. Hello, Mr. Lippy, he said. I kept calm, but I think Mr. Grote is ill. The old man was lying in bed, and ill was too jolly at work. What happened to him? said Mr. Lippy, and gently, Mr. Grote was made off at all. It was like a big bird, but I frightened it off, said Stanley. I hit it in the mouth with a sack of pins. I had a little moment, sir. Well, that ought to do it, said Moist. Now, can you follow me? I've got all the stamps, said Stanley, and the cash box. Mr. Grote keeps them under his bed for safety. The boy beamed. And your hat too. I kept calm. Well done, well done, said Stanley. Now, stick right behind me, OK? What about Mr. Tiddles, Mr. Lippy? said Stanley. Somewhere, Somewhere outside in the hall there was a crash, and the crackle of the fire grew distinctly loud. Mr. Tiddles, the cat, to help him. Moist and stopped. He'll be outside to the bedroom, eating a toasted rat and grinning. Come on, will you? But he's the post office cat, said Stanley. He's never been outside. But he has that sort of voice. But there was that engine in his voice again. Let's get Mr. Grote out of here, OK? He said, easing his way through the door with the old man in his eyes. And then I'll come back for tin. A burning beam 
drops to the floor halfway across the hall and sends sparks and burning envelopes spiralling upwards into the main blaze. It roars, a wall of flame, a fiery waterfall in reverse, up through the other floors and out through the roof. It thundered. It was fire let loose and making the most of it. Part of Moist Fun Lit Big was happy to let it happen, but a new and troublesome part was thinking, I was making it work. It was all moving forward. The stamps were really working. It was as good as being a criminal to that crime. It has been fun. Come on, Stanley, Moist snapped. Turning away from the horrible sight, the fascinating thought. The boy followed reluctantly, crossing the deck, and all the way to the door. The air outside struck like a knife, but there was a round of applause from the crowd, and then a flash of light that Moist became associated with eventual trouble. Good evening, Mr. Lipfig the cheery voice of Otto Shriek. My word, if we want news, all we have to do is for you. The boy ignored him and shoved his way to the he noticed he was not as far as that far. Is there a hospice in the city? He said, but he's not free. There are these lady civil free. Is it any good? Some people don't die. That good, eh? Get in there right now. I've got to go back in for the cat. You are going to go back in there for a cat? It's Mr. Tibbles, said Stanley Grimley. He was born in the post office. Best not to argue, said Moist, turning to go. See to Mr. Grove, will you? Miss Dearheart looked down at the old man's bloodstained shirt. But it looks as though some creature tried to... She began. Something fell on him, said Moist shortly. That could be called something fell on him, said Moist. That's what happened. She looked at his face. All right, she did. Something fell on him. Something with big claws. No, a joist with lots of nails in it. Something like that. Anyone can see that. That's what happened, was it? Said Miss Dear. No point in getting the watch. He thought hurriedly into the doors. They'll come around. There won't be any answers for them. And in my experience, what? Always like to arrest somebody. Did you think it was Richard Gilt, Mister? Did you think it wasn't it? Oh, you could tell, could you? That's a skill of yours, is it? Funny thing, we can tell sometimes too. You were a very familiar face with the Olympic. Where are you from? No, there was no point in getting friendly with the watch. They might be. lying mainly with dogs and beer, but he should have done. The vision of Mr. Grote's chest kept bumping insistently against his imagination. It looked as though something with claws had taken a swipe at him, and only the thick uniform coat prevented him from being opened like a bag. Thank you. 
big bird with a sack full of pins. Stanley the Vampire Slayer with a bag of pins. You wouldn't believe it unless you'd seen him in what one of Mr. Grip called his little moments. He probably could not kill a vampire with pins. And after a thought like that, it's when you realise that however hard you try to look behind you, there's a behind you, behind you, where you want to be. Moist flung his back to the cold stone wall and slithered along it until he ran out of wall and acquired a door frame. The faint blue glow of the sorting engine was just visible. As Moist appeared in the machine's room, Tiddles was visible too. He was crouched under the engine. That's a very cat thing you're doing there, Tiddles, said Moist, standing in the Come to Uncle Moist, please. He sighed and hung the suit on an old letter rack and cracked it down. How were you supposed to pick up a cat? He'd never done it. Cats never figured in grandfather's lip fixer chemicals except as an impromptu snack. As his hand drew near to it, the cat flattened its ears and hissed. Do you want to cook down here? No claws, please. The cat began to growl, and Moist realised that it wasn't looking directly at him. Good tittles, he said, feeling the terror begin to rise. It was one of the prime rules of exploring in a hostile environment. Do not bother with that. And suddenly, the environment was a lot more hostile. Another important rule was, don't turn around slowly. Not the cat, damn the cat, it's something else. He stood upright and took a two-handed grip on the wooden stake. It's right behind me, yes, he thought. Bloody well, bloody right, bloody behind me. Of course it is, how could things be otherwise? The feeling of fear was almost the same as the feeling he got when, say, a mark was examining a glass diamond. Time slowed a little, every sense was heightened, and there was a taste of copper in his mouth. Don't turn round, Stanley, turn round fast. He spun and screamed and crushed. The state of metal resistance was yielded only slightly. The long tail face grinned at him in the light. It showed the rose and pointy teeth. He screamed both. Moist jumped back as a thin, tall hand sliced through the air that kept the stake in front of him, jamming with it. Oh, hell. Only when he moved did Gryle's leathery black cape swing aside briefly to show the skeletal figure beneath him. It helped if you knew that the black devil was weak. It helped if you thought the man cheese was the only human race that had evolved the ability to fly in some lush jungle somewhere where they hunted flying squirrels. It didn't help much if you knew why the story had grown up, that hearing the scream of the banshee meant you were going to die. It meant that the banshee was tracking you. No good looking behind you if you were there. There weren't many of the feral ones, even in Superfans, but Moist knew the advice passed off by people who survived them. Keep away from the mouth of those teeth are vicious. Don't attack the chest. The flight muscles there are like armour. They're not strong, but they've got sinews like steel cables, and the long reach of those arm bones will mean it can slap your silly head right off. Tiddles yowled and backed further under the sorting engine. Gryle slashed the moist again and came after him as he backed away. But their necks snap easily if you can get inside their reach, and they have to shut their eyes when they scream. Gryle came forward, head bobbing and strutting. There was nowhere else for Moist to go, so he tossed aside the wood and put up his hand. All right, I give it, he said. Just make it quick, okay. The figure kept looking at the golden suit. It had a spectacle on his I'm going somewhere afterwards, said Moist helpfully. Gryle hesitated. He was hurt, disoriented, and had equal patience with an effort on wings. He wanted to get out of here and up into the cool sky. Everything was too complicated here. There were too many targets, too many smells. For a banshee, everything was in the house, with teeth and claws and body weight all bore down at once. Now, bewildered, he struck it back and forth, trying to deal with the situation. There was no room to fly, nowhere else to go. The prey was standing there. Instinct, emotion, and some attempt at rational thought all banged together in Gryle's overheated head. Instinct, leaping at things with claws out and worked for a million years, so why not now? He threw back his head, screamed, and sprang. So did Moist, ducking under the long arms. That wasn't programmed into the Banshee's responses. The prey should be huddled or running away. But Moist's shoulder caught him in the chest. The creature was as light as a child. 
Moist felt a claw smash through his arms he fell something onto the sword edge and flung himself to the floor. For one horrible moment, he thought he was going to get up and it's going to be up. But as he had made it to the ship, there was a sound. something to remove them. He lurched out into the corridor. There was a wall of fire at both ends and Tiddles chose this moment to sink all four sets of claws into his arm. Ah! Up until now, he's done him big. Are you all right, he's done him big? What golems were moving as far as the fire was in the fire? They took out the burning corridor and the was burning. It was curiously surgical. They assembled at the edge of the fire and deprived it of anything to burn, herded it, cornered it, and stabbed it to death. Golems could wade through lava and pour molten iron. Even if they knew what fear was, they wouldn't find it in a mere burning building. Glowing rubble was pulled away from the steps by red hot hands. Moist stared up into a landscape of flame, but also, in front of it, Mr. Pumple. He was glowing orange. Specks of dust and dirt on his clay flashed and sparkled. Good to see you, Mr. Big Big, he boomed cheerfully, tossing a crackling beam sign. We have cleared a path to the door. Move with speed. Um, thank you, shouted Moist above the roar of the flames. There was a path to drag to clear the debris, with the open door beckoning calmly and calmly at the end of it. Away towards the far end of the hall, other golems, oblivious of the pillars of flame, were calmly throwing burning floorboards and the wall. The heat was intense. Touched the terrified cat to his chest, the back of his neck began to roast and scatter the floor. Then, before the came one ever, the crashing noise high above, the metallic form, the golem Ang Hamrad looking up with his messy glowing yellow on his cherry red arm. Ten thousand tons of rainwater pouring down in deceptive slow motion, the cold hitting the glowing golem, the explosion. Flames isn't clay. Do you have a command for me? You have reached a place where there are more orders. What should I do? I believe you have failed to understand my last comment. Ang Hamrad sat down again. Apart from the fact that there was sand rather than ooze underfoot, this place reminded him of the abyssal plain. Generally, people like to move on. They look forward to an afterlife. I will stay here, please. Here, 